I can't do both at once. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, go. A few seconds. Romulo. Vinaka Vakalevu Mbula Vinaka, and welcome uh, uh, to our esteemed uh, panelists uh, this afternoon, uh, to our colleagues and friends from International Idea, and to viewers uh, in Fiji and across the Pacific. We welcome you to this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, we thank you for making the time, the commitment, and the effort to join us uh, as we log in uh, to an important Talano and important conversation. Uh, that we will be having today uh, in term, uh, titled Which Traits Makes uh, a CSO and Electoral uh, Activist. Um, because of the one hour gap, we will try to go straight into the program. Uh, the speakers will be allocated about 10 to 15 minutes to make the presentation, and then there'll be question and answers uh, that will follow. Uh, we have received uh, at least one advanced question uh, that the speakers, of course, will be addressing uh, in the course of their presentation or when uh, we conclude the um, their presentation this afternoon. But if you also have any other advance or follow-up question that you'd like to uh, make during the presentation, please feel free to post into the question, um, the chat, uh, 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 the chat uh, space, and uh, we'll make sure that that's also addressed uh, in the discussion time. And now without uh, much further ado, of course, uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will hand uh, the platform to Mr. Uh, Rajan uh, Murthy, who is the Pacific Coordinator for International Idea, to give us a few uh, his opening remarks, uh, and then I will introduce our esteemed speakers. Thank you. Mr. Murthy, over to you. So you'll need to unmute yourself, Rajan, if you don't mind. Hi, Bula, everyone. Uh, my name is Rajan Murthy, and uh, I'm the program coordinator for Fiji at uh, International Idea. A very warm welcome to the third webinar of the Democratic Development in Melanesia webinar series 2021. We are very glad that you have joined us this afternoon. As mentioned, today's topic is which trait make a CSO an electoral activist? Now, uh, why did we choose this topic? The CSOs in the Melanesian region, Fiji in particular, over the years have shown keen interest on elections in their respective countries. Many of these CSOs are not specialized in political and electoral reforms, which is not unusual. This webinar has been designed with the thought that the CSOs can be encouraged by the presentation on how to become an effective electoral activist among other great work that is being done by the CSOs. Our speakers this afternoon are Titi Angrani, who is the board member of Perudum, which is Association for Election and Democracy in Indonesia having previously been its executive director for 10 years. Our second speaker is Louis Tito Guinea, who is a former election commissioner in Philippines and has been active in civil society activities involving electoral reforms and election monitoring work. He's the co-founder of the Legal Network for Truthful Elections, in short, LENTE, a CSO specializing on electoral reform and has recently observed a plebiscite in Palawan region in March. Now, why did we choose Indonesia and Philippines uh, for our presentation? The reason we chose Indonesia and Philippines is because both the countries have CSOs who are specialized in political and electoral reforms. These two countries are closest to the Melanesian region and they have been active for decades and not years on electoral matters, and they will have useful experience to share with us today. Also, these two countries are the most democratic countries in the Southeast Asia. Of course, every country's context is different, but there are common threads that can be found. We hope 
that the presentation this afternoon will be helpful to the participants and to help in their approach towards electoral reforms in their respective countries. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Murthy, for your opening remarks uh, this afternoon. Uh, I am, of course, delighted to be the moderator for this uh, important uh, uh, webinar. Uh, we thank you for also for highlighting uh, the purpose, the reasons why uh, we are engaging in this conversation and why we've invited the esteemed speakers uh, from Indonesia and uh, Philippines respectively. And of course, it is on that uh, note, I uh, welcome uh, our esteemed speakers, Ms. Titi and Mr. Louis, Ms. Titi from Indonesia. Uh, I, I greet you, uh, of course, in, um, I, I greet you. And uh, of course, Mr. Louis, I greet you also. Welcome to the Pacific. Uh, and we are delighted to have you. Uh, as uh, uh, Rajan has uh, briefly introduced them, uh, my task now is to at least give a little bit more background on who the speakers are uh, so that, uh, that uh, we can have an appreciation of their expertise and their experience as they uh, share with us their experience before we come in a time of question and answers. Uh, I also welcome our, our um, participants uh, and friends who are connecting via the Facebook live platform. Welcome to uh, the webinar this, eve this afternoon uh, that's organized by the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance or International IDEA. Uh, firstly, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our um, uh, first speaker is Ms. Titi Angaraini, uh, who is from Indonesia. Uh, salam, uh, Ms. Titi, and again, welcome. Ms. Titi is currently the advisory board member of the Association for Elections and Democracy, or PEM, uh, uh, PELUDEM, uh, an NGO that is engaged in the research and advocacy of elections and democracy in Indonesia. Uh, Ms. Titi previously was a member of the Election Supervisory Committee at the central level for the 1999 general elections. And in the 2006 to 2008, uh, Titi worked with the Rehabilitation and Reconstruction Body for Akanias or BRR Akanias uh, in managing legislative strengthening program at the tsunami affected areas throughout Akanias. Uh, in 2017, Ms. Titi was recognized as a democracy ambassador by International IDEA for her work in promoting free, fair, and democratic elections. Maybe uh, at this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, we will hear from Ms. Titi before I then invite Mr. Louis as well as introduce him uh, before his session. So Ms. Titi, welcome, and I give you the platform. Naka. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Romulo. Can you hear my voice? Okay. You are very loud and clear. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I hope you all can see my uh, PowerPoints on the screen. Uh, good morning uh, for, uh, for friends in Jakarta and Indonesia, and also good afternoon for, uh, for all friends in Fiji. Uh, thank you so much uh, to International IDEA for inviting me uh, to join this conversation. I believe that I can learn many things from Pa Louis from Philippines and also from all the friends uh, in Fiji. Um, I think I have 10 minutes. I will start uh, my presentation to share my own experiences and also uh, my experience uh, with uh, Perludem, Association for Election and Democracy in dealing with the uh, electoral activism in Indonesia. Uh, my name is Titi Angraini. You can call me Titi. Uh, I work with Perludem uh, more or less for 12 years. Uh, and now I uh, assign as the advisory board uh, member. Um, you can contact me through my email or my IG, uh, Instagram or my Twitter uh, as I uh, uh, wrote uh, on the screen. Um, per, what is Perludem? Uh, you can check through our website, uh, perludem.org. Uh, Perludem is an independent non-profit organization that carries out research, advocacy, monitoring, education, and training in the field of election and democracy. So we are focusing uh, specifically on election and democracy. For policymakers, organizers, it means election organizers, EMBs, election contestants, uh, 
political parties and candidates, individual candidates or, or candidate representing political party, and also uh, voters whose source of funds come from fundraising and other non-binding assistance. We receive uh, assistance from international idea to do so many research and also from like IFAS, uh, USAID and so on and so on. Um, we, uh, when we work to promote election and democracy in Indonesia, uh, Perludem and its personnel are guided by the agreed values uh, of uh, as follows. Uh, first, non-partisan, uh, second, integrity, and then fair, equality, participatory, freedom, and independent. Those uh, values uh, guided us in doing our activities in dealing with uh, election and democrat, uh, democracy issues in Indonesia. So all of our programs uh, and even our uh, daily attitudes must represent all those uh, values. This is what we call it uh, Perludem strategic values, or uh, in Bahasa Indonesia, what we call it nilai-nilai uh, organisasi Perludem. And uh, related to our topics uh, this afternoon or this morning, uh, what uh, are main traits that uh, I uh, uh, use in doing my activities uh, as a electoral uh, as an electoral activist? First, as electoral activists we are not political observers. Uh, me and Perludem activists work and deliver its opinion based on data, what we call it as data activism, uh, data electoral activism. Um, Perludem activists do not comment on the electability of candidates, do not provide political support for and on behalf of any candidate. Um, what we didn't do, uh, we didn't do partisan activism. For example, predict which coalition would succeed in the election, which candidate would win, which candidate had the greatest chance to win or to lose, and so on. So no partisan activism. However, um, me and Perludem activists promotes values based on democratic election principle, principles. So what we promote is based on the democratic principles. For example, how to be a good voter, how to choose democratic leaders, educate the public to guard free and fair election, uh, and uh, et cetera. That the main traits uh, uh, conducted by uh, us in uh, Perludem. Um, policy advocacy is one of the main activities of Perludem. Because we are in Perludem believes that democratic elections start from a good legal framework. Um, therefore, uh, Perludem is very active in conducting policy advocacy in order to uh, realize a quality election law. Um, we per, uh, advocate to parliament, to government, to EMBs, election, monitor, uh, election management bodies, because in Indonesia, we are so unique, uh, Mr. Romulo, in Indonesia, we have three uh, EMBs, uh, election commission, election supervisory body, and uh, ethic honorary uh, council to supervise the election organizers' ethics. So uh, we have three uh, EMBs in Indonesia. And also we, we, we work with political parties, community leaders, academics, uh, university actors, and all relevant parties. Um, but one uh, principle that uh, we committed is that the policy advocacy conducted proportionally and equally to all stakeholders. For example, uh, in uh, 2016, Perludem and the civil society coalition, uh, coalition across issues and institution prepare uh, an alternate draft of the election law and presented it to the parliament and the government as material for the preparation of the election law, which they were working on. So we have our own uh, draft that we propose uh, to government and uh, uh, parliament. The draft uh, developed together among CSOs, not only election CSOs, but also uh, human rights CSOs, women CSOs, uh, youth CSOs, uh, indigenous people CSO, so it's uh, across uh, issues and institution. 
um, Perludem is also very active in taking legal efforts to constitutional court. In Indonesia, uh, uh, beside Supreme Court, we also have constitutional court. For example, to conduct judicial review of articles of laws that are deemed to be contrary to the constitution. So we are not only uh, doing advocacy through policy makers, but also through the courts. We are very active in uh, dealing with the courts. Um, this is uh, uh, the coalition. Uh, when we submit the alternate draft on the election law, you can see that more than 40 uh, CSO gather together to develop the CSO draft. And then this uh, draft uh, uh, widely uh, disseminated to all the uh, stakeholders dealing with election. Uh, you can see women CSOs, a woman Research Institute, and then uh, this is university uh, institution, and then um, uh, human rights institution, and then this people with disabilities institution. So we try to invite as many as uh, organization to join this coalition. And then the product of this coalition is an alternate uh, draft of election law. Um, this is uh, one of the picture when I was uh, invited to present uh, the draft from civil society in front of the Commission 2 of uh, National Parliament of the Republic of Indonesia. This is uh, in the early of the pandemic uh, uh, era, early of 2020. Uh, this is the leaders of the parliament, uh, the Commission 2 of Indonesian Parliament. And it's me, uh, uh, some of the members of the parliament joined the session through the online platform uh, Zoom. Um, so um, we are uh, apa, very often invited by parliament to deliver our uh, insights and uh, opinion on uh, elections uh, uh, law. Um, this is when we disagree with the result of the law. Uh, as you can see on the screen, I went, uh, me and uh, Perludem, uh, we went to constitutional court uh, to appeal on the some articles on the law that uh, violating the constitution. This is uh, uh, in the middle of uh, 2020 during the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this is before the pandemic. Uh, the first picture when uh, we submit a petition on the il, uh, on the parliamentary threshold because in indonesia we think that the numbers of the parliamentary threshold are not uh, what is it uh, promulgated or not developed based on the uh, what is it uh, 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 realistic and reasonable uh, arguments uh, the second picture when uh, uh, we went to constitutional court to uh, defend the right to vote uh, uh, for the indigenous voters and for the voter with disabilities. So not only dealing with the policy makers, but we also went to the court uh, 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 to fight for the uh, uh, quality election law. Um, uh, we are also working closely with the election uh, management bodies. Uh, me, myself, and also uh, several friends, uh, some friends in Perludem, uh, several colleagues in Perludem, uh, being part of the uh, bridge uh, trainers team. Bridge is the training tra training uh, team uh, that promoted by International IDEA, uh, IFES, uh, UNDP, and AEC. So uh, me involve uh, me myself and some uh, coll some colleagues in Perludem also involved in uh, doing uh, training for election organizers. This picture when I conducted uh, a training for uh, election organizers in Lampung province. It is one of the province in Indonesia. And I regularly uh, invited to give a training for the election organizers and also uh, both from election commission and also election supervisory body. So um, we uh, have a good cooperation to strengthen the capacity of election organizers in Indonesia. Um, but we also faces uh, we also face challenges uh, uh, for being an electoral activist. I think it's very common, yeah, <laughs> faced by the electoral activists. 
accusation of being a comprador of foreign interest. Usually when we are uh, uh, getting close with the election, there uh, were so many narrative on uh, a comprador of foreign interest. And the second one is suspicions about the source of the Perludem funds, particularly in the relation uh, to foreign funding. And uh, the third one, I think this is the biggest uh, problem we face now in Indonesia, lack of funding and organization sustainability. So it puts us to be more creative to do the uh, fundraising by uh, selling books. Uh, we have our like uh, printed publication and we sell books. Uh, we uh, conduct uh, trainings uh, for uh, the, who, who, who uh, are interested to join the training. Uh, and then uh, the allegation that we sided with one of the parties. But mostly, however, more often by group A, we are accused uh, of siding with group B and vice versa. For us, that, uh, that it means that we are still neutral when all the groups uh, thinking that you are part of the other group. Um, and the last one, activities during the pandemic are mostly done, uh, done online. Uh, we face some of the Zoom hacking and also attacks on social media by the buzzer. Um, for uh, us, maybe in Perludem, uh, it may be a minor annoyance, but for those who just want to become activists, it can be so scary. I think uh, that's all for, for my presentation. I would like to hear comments, critics, and respond from you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Titi, for uh, enlightening us about the work that you do and uh, the important uh, role of training, community awareness, and of course, uh, highlighting uh, key issues within the electoral spaces in Indonesia. Uh, we, we note the content, uh, context uh, of uh, the work that you do, the struggles, the challenges, and of course, I'm sure the participants will probably like to ask uh, further uh, questions uh, during our question and answer time. Uh, but, but of course, if there's anyone that has any question for Ms. Uh, Titi, feel free to put it up on the chat. Uh, uh, part of a uh, uh, component of Zoom or via Facebook, if you're watching via Facebook. Uh, but but I'm sure uh, there'll be a lot of uh, um, uh, important questions that will uh, come out from the civil society groups uh, as we hear uh, the work that you're currently doing. Uh, but, but if you don't mind, we will go to Mr. Louis and then we'll get the questions together once he completes his presentation. Uh, on that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, we welcome those that have just joined us, particularly from the Republic of Palau and across the Pacific, as had been alluded to, this is a webinar that's uh, targeting Melanesian countries, but for this purpose in particular, we are looking at Fiji, uh, specifically Fiji, and uh, therefore, uh, but, but we also welcome uh, participants that are joining uh, across the oceans uh, today. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'll briefly introduce uh, Mr. Louis Guia from the Philippines. Uh, Kumusta, uh, Mr. Guia. Uh, he was a commissioner at the Commission of, on Elections, or the COMLEC, in the Philippines. Uh, President Benigo Aguino uh, III appointed him to the position on 15th April 2013, with a term that was completed only last year in February. Before he was appointed an election commissioner, Mr. Guia uh, has uh, had more than 20 years of direct election experience in the Philippines. He started his election work as an executive assistant of the chairman of Comelec in 1992 to 1995. He subsequently became an election law consultant in the poll body between 1996 and 1998. He has also practiced his law after his Comelec stint. Mr. Guia was also a domestic and an international election consultant. He has assisted COMELEC in drawing up its strategic plan in 2011 by sharing international standards on election dispute the, uh, resolution and political finance. He wrote articles on the Philippine automated election law of 2008 and election dispute resolution reform in 2010 and on political finance laws and campaign finance reform 2007 and 2010 and on updating the legal framework of elections in 2008 and 2010 respectively among other others, uh, other roles that he has engaged in. Again, Mr. Guia, we are uh, delighted to have you come and speak to us and share with us your varied experience, particularly from the electoral uh, management body side. 
Uh, so uh, we now give you the platform. Thank you. Um. Good um good morning everyone do you hear me Very clear thank you Okay um All right so um yes um um I'm I'm very glad and honored to be invited uh, to participate in this uh, webinar um for Fiji and uh, the other Melanesian country and uh, I think it's very appropriate for me to take off from uh, the presentation of uh, my good friend Titi Angriani from Indonesia, because whatever she told you, everything that she told you are, 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 are things that are also applicable in my own experience in my country. Well, uh, I was introduced as an election commissioner and as an election consultant, but prior to that, I have been involved in a lot of uh, civil society uh, uh, organization that deals with electoral reforms and uh, election observation. So uh, my experience uh, brought me from uh, being a, a volunteer in civil society endeavors to observe, monitor election and to propose election reform. And uh, later on, I joined the election commission of the Philippines and became a, a, an election regulator myself. So, um, uh, I know that whenever we talk about uh, the experience of one country, we must, I, I must be a bit more careful about understanding the context uh, to the, uh, of the audience that I am trying to make uh, a presentation for. And uh, so uh, I'm sure that the context in the Philippines is, um, might, might be different from uh, uh, that of Fiji and, and in other Melanesian country, but I, I hope that uh, my sharing with you, which will basically be my own experience, would uh, uh, resonate uh, in terms of uh, maybe providing some uh, lessons or points that can be adopted uh, in your uh, um, country. Now, um, let me start by talking about election observation and monitoring. Uh, well. Um, well, from our context, election observation monitoring consists of undertakings by nonpartisan independent groups. Well, by nonpartisan, I, I, I mean groups that do not support any of the contending political parties, nor uh, the position that they're taking uh, electorally in an election campaign. In other words, nonpartisan means not being connected to any of the contending groups in election but also uh, nonpartisan in the sense that you are not perceived uh, to be uh, identified uh, with either uh, or, or with, with, with those content, uh, contesting the elections. Now, what is the objective of uh, election observation monitor? monitor of course, that is one. Uh, one is to reduce incentives for fraud uh, because you're, you, when, when you know politicians and election management body uh, our, 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 our knows that you no know, independent groups are looking at the process, then you know incentives and inclination to commit fraud is is, is lessened. Now it it is also uh, a way to assess the conduct of the election based on accepted standards, and uh, because you you know uh, there is an independent assessment of the elections by civil society group then probably reforms in the electoral process can be had. So that is how um, uh, uh, we see uh, election monitoring and election observation. Now, in, in relating the Philippine experience, I think it's important for me to be sharing with you the context, the historical context of how uh, CSO's participation in election have developed. Now, um, well, we have had our authoritarian, uh, a, 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 in our history, we have had experienced uh, authoritarian regime or rule, and that is between 1972 and 1986, where uh, uh, there was just one president 
there were pockets of elections or electoral activities, but uh, th these electoral activities are basically perceived to be uh, uh, without integrity and are, 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 are designed to favor um, incumbents. So they were really not democratic election the way a democratic election should be. And, 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 and uh, in 1983, a, a formal, the foremost uh, opposition uh, leader in, in the country, uh, Benigno Aquino Jr., was assassinated. And that triggered the middle class uh, in, in the country to rise up. And, and, and there was then the incentive to look at the way uh, the government and then elections are conducted in the Philippines. Um, because of pressure, um, um, the then incumbent President Marcos called for a, 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 a an, an unscheduled election. We called it a uh, snap presidential election in 1986. And there was, and this provided an impetus for those who are, who were traditionally apathetic or those who are not uh, politically involved to form or to volunteer in a group called National Citizens Movement for Free Elections. And this was the first non-governmental organization and movement that attracted a lot of people because there was this incentive to look at the electoral process to make sure that the previous practices of cheating and uh, on pre previous practices of cheating can, can be prevented with, you know, there was a lot of, also there was a lot of uh, international uh, uh, um, um, coverage uh, in the election and, 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 and having a nationwide network of monitors was seen to be a way by which uh, the administration then who controls the election would uh, uh, be prevented from, um, from, from, let's say, destroying the integrity of the process. So that was it, and it was headed by basically uh, uh, um, private sector uh, uh, personalities, and, and and the core of this group were, were faith-based organization, primarily the Catholic uh, Church in the Philippines. Now, and 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 yes. Uh, there was a transition from uh, a basically authoritarian regime to a democratic uh, uh, regime, and uh, among the uh, among those who were involved in the CSO, CSO, um, or, or the uh, the civil society initiative to monitor the elections, became a member, or became even became the chair of the election commission in 1991. And that was uh, Christian Monsod. And what followed was some sort of a reformist election commission because civil society personalities became part of the government of, of the election commission. And there was this, and this sort of helped speed up the transition from, uh, from an authoritarian uh, uh, um, government setup to that of a democratic. Uh, um, uh, set up. So even the face of uh, CSO participation in elections have changed. So from, from monitoring uh, the electoral process, meaning the voting, counting, and the tabulation process, as well as voter registration process, CSOs involved in elections have transformed and ho or have adapted projects that involve proposing how election laws can be improved. There were even proposals to, you know, revisit the constitutional setup from a presidential uh, uh, form of government to one that is parliamentary. So, in other words, what I'm saying is that, you know, from just looking at uh, uh, the process, the procedural aspect of election, meaning voting, counting, and tabulation, the um, uh, civil society. Uh, perspective became adapt became open to looking at uh, reforms in, in 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 the legal infrastructure of election okay so um and then there was this shift of focus also when the philippines adopted uh 
the use of uh, optical scan system in 20, the 2010 elections, people are now looking at the other aspects of elections like campaign finance, like uh, looking at how inclusive the process is um, um, and by, by, uh, by um, you know, focusing on, on um, voters that are vulnerable to uh, being uh, uh, excluded in the process like indigenous people, like your persons with disabilities, like uh, persons deprived of liberties or the uh, elections by um, um, those in, in, in detention. Now, so um, that is the history that, that, that I think, I, uh, I hope I was able to, you know, in, in very briefly uh, narrate the transition pro, of, of civil society involvement in election from that of just observing the process to, to, um, to looking at the more substantive aspect of elections, the legal framework, the democraticness of elections. So that's how uh, it developed. Now, of course, uh, there are some uh, issues also involving the relationship between election, the election management body and, and civil society organizations doing election work. And uh, let me talk to you about that now. But, you know, we also have experienced uh, um, the situation where, you know, EMBs and EMOs or EMO is an election monitoring organization or CSOs involved in elections. Uh, there, there's an enmity, you know, um, EMOs try to criticize the EMB for its performance and the EMBs uh, try to shun away uh, NGOs from participating or from, you know, uh, um, from um, being involved uh, in, in, in the process. Um, well, I, I have been to both side of the coin. So um, from my point of view, this is what causes uh, the usual enmity between election management body and election uh, uh, monitoring organization. So sometimes election management body uh, proceeds from a paradigm of authority. Since we are given the mandate, to run the election, it's our responsibility. We have the authority to make decision. But in so far as election management, uh, in so far as CSOs are concerned, they are guided by defined norms and ideals of what election should be and how it should be run. So it's more, um, CSO are more guided by the ideals of, of, of democratic, genuine democratic elections. So EMBs, um, perspective is usually uh, defined within the confines of a regulation framework, while CSOs are, you know, um, uh, governed by the framework of maximum participation, meaning everyone um, should be involved in elections. Uh, and and uh, election management bodies have the legal responsibility to run elections, to make it successful, to uh, because they are ultimately legally responsible to the constitution, to the parliament, and 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 or to the president. While CSOs have moral responsibility to ensure that that elections really becomes meaningful to the people in the sense that you know. Um, 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 uh, it was an election, of course, uh, sovereignty, as we say, resides in the people. And that's where uh, uh, CSOs are guided uh, in, when, when, when they work on, on elections. Election management bodies, the reality is that election management bodies are constrained by bureaucratic structures and processes. You know, the function elections are, are, or election processes or formal election processes use government money. So, you know, there are audit requirements, there are uh, bureaucratic government requirements that sometimes slows down the process of delivering elections. But, but uh, you know, CSOs are guided by urgency of reforms that, you know, uh, they find government processes quite slow, but uh, the CSOs would look at, um, uh, the delay as somewhat uh, 
uh, something that needs that may be hard to explain uh, or, or, or they cannot just accept the explanation of you know bureaucratic constraint as hampering a quicker uh, resolution of, of, of issues uh, that uh, should lead to uh, reform. Now election management bodies tend to have tend to think that they have the monopoly of expertise in elections and therefore think of others as people who do not know that much. But sometimes, on the other hand, civil societies think that they have the monopoly of good intentions, that the election management bodies uh, do not really uh, uh, have this in mind. So these are the things that causes the, 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 the conflict or causes conflicts between election management body and CSOs involved in election. So what is the goal there? I think it's important for CSOs and election management bodies to foster mutual understanding. Because anyway, CSOs and EMBs have common societal objectives. All of, both of them should, you know, aspire for free and fair election. Both of them should aspire for honest, orderly, and peaceful, safe elections. Both of them should look at inclusive, transparent, and accountable elections. Okay, both of them, both of that sector wants genuine democratic elections. So th there's really no, there should really be no conflict between CSOs and, uh, and, and, and EMBs. They just have to understand their respective roles in the society. So election management bodies are primarily responsible for the success of the election and, and their decisions are usually final. However, um, election management bodies should also listen to what CSOs have to say in terms of uh, what the common good is because you know CSOs are, are the ones that articulate the uh, aspirations of the people. And, and, and they have to understand that CSOs Guide, are guided by defined standards, uh, which may not be easily understood by those in, in government. Now, so what should be the ideal relationship between government, election commission, or the secretariat of election on the one hand, and on the other hand, civil society organizations or election monitoring organization. One, they should... Uh, the relationship should be built on trust and mutual respect. And there should always be continuing dialogue and open lines of communication. Because what is, what is going on between CSOs and government are, is usually uh, um, uh, proceeds, usually proceeds from mistrust. So a continuing dialogue and continuing open line of communication would somehow bridge the gap between uh, the perspective of government and, and civil society. And, and, and maybe it's good to also involve in collaboration in finding solutions to problems in electoral process rather, rather than, you know, um, presenting, rather than not talking and rather than, you know, uh, throwing brickbats against each other. And uh, it may be good that at the end of the day, both the government and the CSO share uh, in the success in the conduct of uh, election. So um, uh, I have a few examples of, of how these were done in the Philippines. Now there are civil society groups which have uh, th that have worked with the election commissions and uh, has produced uh, a good result, like the groups that I've been involved with. The Legal Network for Truthful Election uh, has been doing works for indigenous people, and some, and it has partnered with the partnered with the Election Commission to make the process more inclusive. So some of the suggestions that came from uh, uh, from civil society were adopted as regulations by Election Commission, and 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 at the end of the day, it improved the process. Like uh, for instance. Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism, PCIJ, had uh, written some, uh, you know, um, uh, articles on, on, on campaign and political finance or money and politics issues. And that, uh, you know, uh, sort of gotten the attention of the election commission. And uh, 
Election Commission started energizing its its uh, the the whole bureaucracy to create a campaign finance office whose job it is to look at the uh, money the um, uh, expenses and, and donations expenses incurred by candidates during elections and donations uh, um, and uh, donations uh, received by political parties. So, um, and, and just like in Indonesia, uh, personalities of uh, the Barrio Civil Society Organization are invited in our Congress or in our parliament to as resource speaker in, in laws or electoral reform laws that are being deliberated in our uh, legislature. But of course, uh, it is also important for civil society group to keep an arm's length distance from the uh, from the government, and because that is their role, their role is to represent the people in looking at processes of the government to hold government accountable and 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 um, and and to make sure that the government uh, through the election commission does its work in 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 in, in election. So uh, you can collaborate, but you can, but while keeping an arm's length distance. From government, so that is how uh, effective civil society organizations have uh, conducted themselves, and it is not in. Uh, it has not always been. Uh, uh, the relationship has not always been been good, uh, but uh, there is always there should always be this attempt, and that is what uh, both sides are doing to to bridge some of the gaps and try to understand each other's uh, uh, position. So I think I will end there and I will welcome questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Louis. Thank you again uh, to you and Ms. Titi for your very comprehensive uh, uh, discussions around the uh, experiences as well as all your all ongoing work in the various hats that you have uh, talked to us about. Uh, in the electoral spaces of both Indonesia and the Philippines. And now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will open up the platform uh, for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, please, uh, if you can indicate that by your, um, uh, either through the emoji or you can just turn on your screen uh, and give me a wave and I'll hand over the platform to you. But I also note that uh, we had received an advanced question from Ms. Tandakovula. Uh, and uh, if that has not been forwarded to the speakers, uh, then I'm happy to, or I see Mr. Ndakovula here, and if you'd like to ask his questions uh, to the panelists, then uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, now we open up the platform uh, for questions uh, this afternoon. Thank you, uh, if there's uh, any question, uh, but otherwise, uh, Ms. Uh, Louis and uh, Ms. Titi, there was an advanced question uh, that we had received uh, and had been forwarded, uh, uh, you know, uh, that we had, we had received from Mr. Ndakchon Ndakuvula. Uh, if you have not had the opportunity to see the questions, I'm happy to uh, provide that for you. But first, uh, and so the first question is, uh, in a situation where a government that came to power by military coup and has introduced a decreed constitution, an electoral system that is rigged in favor of the government, what is the most effective way for an NGO with interest in electoral uh, change to actively influence change? I know that uh, you had spoken, Mr. Louis, about the challenges that the Philippine uh, history, uh, that's yeah. probably similar uh, in post-conflict societies uh, like ours. Uh, uh, so maybe I'll give you first the opportunity and then if Ms. Titi would like to also uh, contribute. Mr. Louis. Uh, thank, uh, yes, uh, thank you, Romolo. That's not an easy question to answer because of course uh, Fiji has its own uh, context, but it, it's really looking at democracy. And, and how uh, CSOs would uh, see uh, uh, democracy flourishing uh, in their own uh, country. And, 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 and that is, uh, to me, I think it, it, there, there is a natural uh, 
somehow automatic progression on 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 the part of CSOs to look at how democracy uh, is in their country and how they can uh, um, you know engage. Um, of course, my presentation and that of Titis is based on 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 a situation where there is already established government and 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 the the the, the the constitutional and legal framework seem to have been accepted by uh, most of the uh, uh, most of the population, uh, and 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 the thing that you would look at, look, try to look at, are you know some things that are not as basic as probably the uh, viability of the constitution itself uh, being uh, made to uh, 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 the term that was used was imposed. Uh, on the country, so that, that that's a very uh, different situation. But I I, I think it, there's a natural progression of uh, civil society activism to look at uh, how uh, uh, people can engage uh, uh, the government and perhaps take action uh, on 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 what uh, uh, how things can be fixed at your end, but. Uh, um and uh of course that will always start with you know raising awareness and creating a constituency of uh reform minded uh citizens that will specifically look at uh, democratic uh, reforms i think that's the first uh okay. step there Thank you, uh, Mr. Louis. Uh, Ms. Titi, would you like to add anything uh, yeah. to that earlier comment? Over to you then. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Romulo. Um, in Indonesia, there was an attempted military coup in the early of uh, 90s, but it failed. Uh, so we don't have like a, a, a government coup uh, in Indonesia, but we were under an authoritarian government for uh, more than 32 years. Then uh, there was uh, people power in 1998 and followed by the recite nation or uh, the step down of uh, President Suharto. It's not easy to have 32 uh, years of uh, fascism or authoritarian regime. Yeah. So it, it took a long uh, time uh, to uh, fight for the democratic uh, government, democratic regime like what we have now. Uh, one thing I learned, because I'm part of the reform uh, movement in 1998, together with uh, uh, Mr. Adi Aman. Actually, uh, Adi Aman is my senior in university. Um, external or uh, international community support is uh, playing a very significant role. How we can get other supports and learn uh, and sharing knowledge uh, and movement with other uh, countries uh, will help us to strengthen our movement. We have a massive uh, student uh, and university movement in 1997 until 1998. Uh, that's why, and then Suharto resigned from his position. And we have a massive uh, reform uh, process in Indonesia. But it is also not easy, Pak Ramulo, Mr. Ramulo, because now we have so many uh, homework uh, to deal with, especially on how we can strengthen the democratic institution, uh, specifically uh, political party. So we reform our voters, we reform our um, government, but sometimes we forget to reform our political parties. <laughs> so um, now uh, we are facing one of the biggest problem is dysfunction of political parties in Indonesia. So um, I can say that uh, international uh, community support, international uh, apa, uh, organization supports to our movement uh, is very important. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for highlighting those very important points. And you know, uh, I think what you really what you what you've said is that it's an ongoing uh, process. Uh, uh, it's an ongoing engagement uh, with civil society and with the political actors and uh, the different bodies that uh, uh, infuse within the electoral space. So thank you for that. Uh, 
is there any uh, uh, question either from uh, the Facebook audience or from any of our audience that are uh, online via Zoom? Uh, otherwise, then uh, we'll look at the other questions that have been sent in from uh, Mr. Ndakubula. I'll give this time if there's any question from the participants. All right, because of time, because of time, I uh, will continue to move on. And if there's any question, then, uh, uh, then we will uh, come to the participants this afternoon. The second question that had been sent uh, 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 this morning uh, is, uh, is it possible for an NGO to influence change by trying to work with the electoral office and the politicians in the government? Have there been any progressive results achieved by NGOs that took this strategic uh, approach? Uh, maybe, Ms. Titi, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll ask you if you can answer this first before I uh, hand the platform to Mr. Louis. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Romulo. I think I already a little bit explained about this in my uh, presentation, in my PPT. So it's very uh, possible uh, to uh, influence the policy making process and also to influence the regulation uh, making process. But uh, as mentioned by uh, Mr. Louis that every country has its uh, specific situation. In Indonesia, relatively CSO and uh, parliament and government and EMBs, we can uh, have a good cooperation without uh, uh, interference each other. Um, uh, for example, as, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, uh, in uh, 2016, uh, 2016, we formed a huge coalition to promote alternate draft uh, on election law and then doing a massive advocacy uh, to promote that uh, draft to uh, parliament, government, uh, and then other uh, uh, stakeholders. And um, some of the provisions adopted by uh, uh, government and parliament and many of it's not uh, adopted by uh, them. So, um, but I think that's a good example uh, that uh, building a good uh, cooperation and uh, coalition among CSOs, uh, CSOs is one of the fundamental strategy. By having a coalition of CSO, at least we can accommodate uh, uh, many ideas from different groups from uh, women uh, activists, uh, uh, people with disability activists, um, um, and then minority groups, university actors, uh, human rights activists. We try to invite uh, involvement uh, of all of the uh, uh, organization. It's not easy. It, it takes a long time to deal with so many hats, so many uh, opinion and also um, so many institution. But by having like international idea, uh, in international election foundation, uh, IFAS uh, uh, to support uh, this uh, coalition and this movement, movement at least um, we can achieve uh, some of our goals. So um, I'm sure that Indonesian uh, situation is different with Fiji, but by having dialogue, by having uh, an intense communication with the um, political actors, with uh, governments, uh, we can achieve uh, uh, our goals. Uh, for example, Mr. Romulo, because I have a good uh, relationship and communication with um, MPs, uh, female MPs, female uh, parliament MPs, uh, members, so uh, I uh, regularly talk to them about uh, the ideas about our initiatives and um, they are the female MPs usually will deliver the uh, ideas, the opinion to other, uh, their other colleagues. That also helps us in advocating our issues. So we, we try to build uh, as a massive uh, coalition we can do and also talk uh, intensively with the policymakers. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Romulo. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Titi, for your comprehensive response. Uh, you know, uh, in, uh, cooperation as well as international support uh, is two of the things that I could pick up from your response this afternoon. I thank you for that. I'll leave it at that and cross over to Mr. Louis. And then if there's anyone else uh, in the panel, in the audience that would like to do a follow-up question, please feel free to unmute your screen and ask your question. Mr. Louis, would you like to respond to the same question? Yes, uh, very quickly. Well, uh, the same experience in the Philippines as it is in uh, Indonesia, uh, as is in Indonesia, most of the reforms actually in election administrations and, and, and the improvement of perspective within the election administration came from the participation of civil society group in the process. So, um, um, you know, looking at, you know, uh, more giving focus on the vote on voting by indigenous peoples, by persons with disability. These are concepts that came, that were introduced by civil societies participating in the process with the election commission, looking at campaign finance. Well, uh, previously what election, election management body merely looks at, uh, at, at, at the voting counting and, you know, the traditional, usual things that you see in elections. Uh, but, uh, you know, when, when civil society started recommending that the election commission should look at campaign finance as well. And then, you know, that, that made the election commission um, uh, develop its capacity to monitor. It's not perfect. There are a lot of things to improve on, but what I'm saying is that the initiative and the perspective comes from the civil society. This is what collaboration can do. And yes, you know, um, the civil society group or civil society organizations were able to come up with those kinds of uh, uh, um, of, of, of uh, recommendation because of international support. So th there were also support from international donor organization, which you know enabled civil society to. Uh, uh, to, to, to work on this. So it, they, they are homegrown uh, suggestions supported by, uh, you know, international, international organization inspired by international best practices, probably. Right. So yes, uh, 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 it happened in, in my country. Thank you, uh, Mr. Louis. That's, that's wonderful to hear that, you know, and, and as you constantly both emphasize that even though the contexts are different, that, you know, there's also that similarity when you see how uh, the CSOs uh, movements continue to advocate for the changes that is required uh, in terms of, and, and that's done through collaboration uh, as well as uh, collisions. Huh? So thank you, thank you for that point. Uh, now, there are some questions that are popping up now on our chat screen. Uh, so Ms. Titi and uh, Mr. Louis, if you've had the opportunity to read that, if not, I'm happy to read through them and also for the benefit of our Facebook audience. Uh, but Ms. Titi, there's a question here for you from Ms. Lina Tameng, and she's asked that, can you say something about how you were able to build a broad CSO collision? around electoral reform? And is there any tips on how to do the same elsewhere, given that CSOs have their own goals and ambitions? Uh, I know you probably have not uh, worked with the CSOs in Fiji, but you know maybe in terms of Ms. Uh, T, uh, Lina's question, if you can see how um, that may work in, in Fiji's context. So over yeah. to you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Romulo. It's a hard question, yeah. Um, from my experience, it's not an, an easy uh, uh, activity, but we start by uh, doing uh, dialogue and communication. So dialogue and communication among CSOs uh, is very important. Goodwill and then uh, try hard to not uh, like uh, uh, follow our ego uh, is a main basis to have a good coalition. And also one, what I learned from my experiences um, support from the senior activists uh, it was helping us to make it easier. Like in Indonesia, uh, we have like Mr. Hadar Nafis Gumai, one of the uh, participants who follows this uh, webinar from Facebook, and also Professor Ramlan Surbakti, Mr. Luigia, know him uh, so well, one of a very senior electoral uh, academician. 
they are we talk to them and then uh, 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 discuss about the idea to have like um, alternate draft on the election law and do, and then by having uh, support from IFES international idea uh, many colleagues from university academician uh, progressive um, uh, community leaders progressive uh, religious leaders and then we can uh, form this uh, coalition so uh, dialogue dialogue uh, communication goodwill and try hard not to uh, uh, what is it use your ego uh, is the key uh, to form uh, this uh, coalition it's not easy um, and the second one is not all of our ideas accepted by government uh, and uh, parliament or policy makers but in indonesia we have um, constitutional court this is one of the product of reform uh, process in uh, 1998 uh, we have constitutional court where we can go when we think that the articles um, in the law uh, what is it contrary with the constitution usually when uh, we think that the articles in the law uh, against the constitution me as a constitutional law uh, constitutional lawyer went to constitutional court uh, to fight for uh, the better uh, provisions uh, on the law so consistency is the second uh, words yeah to express uh, 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 what we we do uh, in doing electoral activism activism it's not easy it takes a long time so if you are not consistent you will so easy uh, apa, uh, will uh, give up and sometimes will accept the offer to be part of the uh, political parties or, or to be part of the uh, government uh, in power. So uh, I think that's my uh, comments on the question, uh, Mr. Romulo. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Siti, uh, for your question. Uh, definitely, and it's, a, it's a difficult one. And, uh, and again, context would be different. But thank you for uh, showing us how at least uh, you uh, and your group uh, in Indonesia uh, have uh, managed to address this challenge. Uh, you know, uh, I hear about collision as well as uh, looking at um, uh, key uh, partners. Uh, to be able to continue to uh, bring about that change. Uh, uh, now, uh, before we continue with any other questions, I note that Ms. Uh, Tarai, uh, she's also here online, had posted a question on this uh, Zoom platform. Uh, Ms. Tarai, if you are hearing me, I, would you like to ask your question to the panelists? Uh, Mr. Rai, are you available? Okay, uh, because of time, uh, uh, the question that she had uh, posted, uh, uh, Mr. Louis and Ms. Titi, is in a society where the government refuses to engage uh, in meaningful dialogues. And I know that you had uh, alluded to this a little bit earlier on, uh, Ms. Titi. Uh, dialogues with CSOs, especially those that speak out against the government, what can be done to ensure that collaboration between the two is fostered? Uh, so maybe I'll hand over to Mr. Louis, uh, and uh, as, as a former member of uh, EMB uh, in the Philippines, and how do you uh, deal with personalities and, and those related challenges of working uh, and making sure that you know, it's the common goal of um, uh, strengthening electoral processes? So over to you, Mr. Louis, and then maybe Ms. Titi, if you'd like to also uh, respond to that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, no, before I became a commissioner at the Philippine Election Commission, I was a, what you call a civil society activist on, on um, electoral reform. So it, it can get frustrating uh, when, you know, especially when the election management body wouldn't listen to what you have to say as to how things can be improved and they would have their own way. Uh, and, and, and that happens. Um, well, what is usually done is to create a demand, make it, make them listen to you. And the only way to do that is to, you know, create a bigger constituency maybe engage the media, talk about issues, make it make sense uh, to, to, to the general public. You know, at the end of the day, your politicians will be accountable or would listen 
to to the people if it, you make enough noise then they'll at the very least give you a venue where you can talk and if it makes sense then um, you know you'll be heard probably i, I don't know i mean of course uh pg and conflict uh, context is difficult but that's how it is done here and if you would make politicians look good by listening to you then there is more incentive for them to open their doors to having you uh, um, you, you have to understand where they're coming from i mean they have to look good they have to look nice you have a good proposal so probably uh, you might want to share it with them give them a bit of uh, some ownership of what you have to propose as a as an activist and perhaps uh, things would open now when i became part of the commission and like that is what i had i mean i can never be successful if i don't listen to my former colleagues because all of these ideal things about democracy and about being inclusive came from my association with the civil society so if i don't give give, give them venue to participate then i would not be achieving my purpose i would not you know I, I i will amount to nothing so perhaps what you can do is to you know of course you have to organize you have to continue making noise and make them well i i I don't think I can use this word. Force them to listen to you. Force them to talk to you. I think that can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Louis. Uh, Ms. Titi? Yeah, I think I have a similar comment to uh, Mr. Louis, but uh, I would like to add some points. Uh, from my experiences, if the policy makers, uh, they don't want to listen to CSO activists or CSO um, uh, institution, so we expand the uh, the advocacy work. We invite other groups to also talk about the issues, talk about the changes uh, to be encouraged, to, to, to be encouraged. For example, in Indonesia, we have two uh, biggest um, um, uh, Muslim uh, organization, Nahdlatul Ulama and Muhammadiyah. So we talk to them because uh, government and parliament willing to listen to them. So uh, we talk to a big uh, mass organization um, and also we talk to the uh, prominent uh, academician uh, who willing to promote reform. So we expand uh, the, the, the narrative we expand uh, the message, not only delivered by us CSOs, but also by the uh, religious organization uh, leaders, uh, public leaders, indigenous uh, uh, people leaders, and also uh, prominent academicians. So we invite them to also join the movement and also media. Uh, we work with the independent journalists, um, so that's why we can uh, deliver the message widely. Uh, that's my uh, uh, comment, Mr. Romulo. Thank you. Thank you for um, for highlighting that other important uh, aspect, uh, as uh, Mr. Lu has also alluded to, the importance of uh, within our context looking at how uh, religious leaders and uh, these influential community voices uh, also can be strategic partners. Uh, in in uh, raising electoral issues and electoral awareness, so uh, uh, that's that's very important. Also, I guess for us uh, here in Fiji, uh, if there's any other members of the panel uh, uh, from um, any other panelists uh, today logging in, if you'd like to ask any question, uh, we have about uh, uh, three or four minutes. Uh, before I will ask uh, maybe uh, Mr. Louis and Ms. Titi if you have any other concluding thoughts or remarks that you'd like to share with us on this very important uh, topic, uh, and particularly given the experiences that you have, as well as the ongoing challenges of uh, CSO um, activism in the electoral spaces uh, in Fiji. And then I'll ask you to then wrap up if there's no other question uh, from the panelists. But for now, uh, we've have, we have about two to three minutes if there's anyone that would like to ask a question to any of the panelists.
Is there any question from uh, panel uh, members uh, logging in today? If not, uh, I we, I'm happy to ask another question that's been posted up, but uh, I give this opportunity to anybody who would like to ask a question first. There's, there's a lot in your presentation to digest uh, to the two speakers. So I'm sure there's uh, a lot of thinking happening uh, this afternoon. If not, uh, there is a question that had been posted uh, by Mr. Herman uh, on the Zoom chat that, uh, that uh, and his question is uh, to the speakers, uh, democracy and elections are now international issues. Uh, although in every country, the issue of democracy and elections is different. However, it still boils down to aspects of law enforcement and human rights. So how do election activists in various countries collaborate to solve, uh, to solve this common problem in future? We looked into the past, now we're being very futuristic. Uh, so if you'd like to attempt to answer that question, then I give you the platform. Uh, maybe Ms. Titi and then uh, Mr. Louis uh, 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 to answer the question. So over to you, Ms. Titi, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Herman from Dompu, East Nusa Tenggara. It's one of the city in Indonesian province. I'm very happy to have you here. Um, well, also, um, I think uh, we cannot uh, make a differentiation between uh, election and human rights because election is part uh, of the human rights, yeah? how we fulfill the right to vote and to uh, right to be candidate um, uh, equally. So um, my, from my experience, I try to uh, have a like um, cooperation, dialogue and also uh, coalition uh, between el election NGOs and also human rights uh, NGOs, as I mentioned earlier. And also, uh, I'm also part of the election, uh, international election community. Uh, Perludem is part of the UNPREL uh, movement, uh, Asia Network for Free Election, member of ADN, uh, Asia Democracy Network. So by having that international network, we hope that we can be part of the international movement, give response to the uh, international situation. We have like a petition on Myanmar situation. We also uh, uh, promote petition on the uh, democ democracy in Hong Kong. So uh, by having like network with international organization, uh, international movement, it helps us to adjust with uh, the current uh, uh, progress and current issues on election and human rights. Uh, I think that's uh, my comment, Mr. Romulo, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Titi, appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Louis. Yes, uh, I just want to reiterate what uh, the, my friend Titi said. Electoral rights are human rights, so you cannot really uh, dissociate electoral elections and uh, and, and human rights, um, and 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 it proceeds from a recognition of uh, you, um, electoral rights being uh, ingrained as uh, what consists uh, human dignity. You know, so if you don't have electoral rights, then you don't have human rights. So that, that's how it is, and it's collaboration really amongst uh, like-minded uh, democracy activists. Um, it, it's actually my uh, uh, occasional conversation with Titi, Pakadar, with some activists in uh, Thailand, Malaysia, that you know that you know energizes uh, my work in my own country, and um, and and it, it's really keeping the conversation amongst yourselves. In, in other words, the civil society groups in, in in Fiji, they need not be democracy or election focused. But there is always a democracy and election aspect on what you do. If you are a gender rights advocate, if you are a, a, a human rights advocate, if you are uh, economic equality advocates, there is always a, an election aspect to what you do. And it's, it's good for you to collaborate among yourselves, at least uh, uh, bound by what should bring you in. And that's, you know, 
democratic rights uh, to, to promote your respective uh, advocacy and being uh, you know connected with uh, your fellow Melanesian civil society activists looking at democracy and election as well will help and expanding it further to let's say uh, your neighbors in Australia and perhaps in Southeast Asia, Indonesia and Philippines will actually make you feel that you're not alone. And this is something that is uh, innate in, 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 in every human being, the right to participate uh, in government. So, so be, con be constantly connected, continue the conversation, how diff however difficult things are. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Louis. I think, you know, that's a, a, an important point also that you both raised as we're coming to the conclusion of this webinar, uh, highlighting again the importance of this process to human rights uh, and the rights of people not only to choose their government, but also to be governed uh, by the, a government of their choice in that sense. So, so thank you uh, uh, both for highlighting those points. I'm extremely mindful uh, that we may have a few minutes, but there's an important question uh, that uh, Mr. Ndakubula had also sent uh, in his uh, uh, list of questions that I'll probably also ask uh, and give you the opportunity to respond to that. And then uh, maybe uh, we can then move to wrapping up our webinar. Uh, this afternoon. Uh, the final question is, uh, how can Melanesian governments uh, and outside NGOs uh, effectively help uh, activist NGOs in Fiji in their desire to achieve a fairer and more democratic uh, electoral system? So basically, uh, for the NGOs that do this work in Fiji and you know the challenges that they face, etc., uh, how can they uh, tap into uh, the networks uh, and NGOs and um, people like yourselves uh, to support uh, and collaborate with them in building and strengthening their capacity as well as uh, learning from some of the traits that you have successfully implemented in your respective countries. So maybe Mr. Louis, if you don't mind, I'll give you the platform first before Ms. Titi, and then we will wrap up our webinar this afternoon. Over to you, Mr. Louis, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you, Romolo. Uh, we're here. I, I think Titi will say the same thing. We're here. We're willing to to help. Uh, you know your context better, but uh, we can share our experience and probably you can pick uh, some similarities that you can adopt uh, uh, um, adopt uh, in your own context. Uh, I, I just form a, a, a small think tank. Uh, uh, it's called Democratic Insights uh, Group. And uh, it does works uh, uh, along the line of uh, democratic reform. So, and, and there are other groups. Just be connected. Let's keep the conversation uh, going. And, and, and if this can be supported by international donor organizations as well, and this will be uh, very good. So, Yes, that probably Romulo, how difficult the challenges are. There will be difficulty. We have not achieved the ideal, even if we have been doing this for what uh, Titi, 30, 40 years probably. But uh, uh, just, just go on, just keep on and doing what we need to do. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Louis, for those uh, nuggets. Uh, before I wrap up, I'll hand over to Ms. Titi, and then, uh, of course, yeah. uh, we'll conclude uh, our discussions. Yeah, I think it's a very uh, interesting and important question. Yeah, uh, follow to Mr. Louis' statement that uh, every country is unique, every election system is unique. There's no ideal election system to each country, but what we are looking for is a fit election system but we can learn from other countries me myself my organization Peludem, and i'm sure my colleagues from indonesian cso's committed to continuing uh, to communicate and share knowledge and experiences with cso's in fiji it's a long process it's uh, require uh, patience consistency uh, more and more dialogue uh, and by having uh, international idea and many international organization, 
uh, bridging our cooperation, bridging our uh, discourse, I think it will help us to strengthen each other. Uh, I'm sure that democracy is like a cycle. Now in Indonesia, believe it or not, we have CSO, um, uh, what is it, watch. CSO watch not to ensure the freedom of CSOs in doing their activities, but to, what is it, to observe, to monitor the CSO activists. So <laughs> I think that's one of the challenges, one of the challenge we face now in Indonesia we not only facing challenges from uh, political actors, but also we face a challenge from our colleagues uh, from civil society or who call themselves as civil society. Uh, I think that's my uh, response, Mr. Romulo. We have to strengthen each other. We have to uh, communicate, we have to share. And uh, what is it? We have to uh, uh, stay in touch, keep contact. Uh, to uh, what is it to keep uh, democracy moving on. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Titi. I'm sure that your contacts, uh, you know, you've both offered uh, to continue the dialogue. Your contacts are and is available with the International Ideas Office, uh, Mr. Rajan, uh, Mr. Adi, and if there's any interest from any of the CSO uh, uh, groups that are um, uh, watching this today or will be watching it in the future, maybe they could contact you both uh, if that's all right from your end. Uh, that then, uh, of course, brings us to the conclusion of this webinar. Uh, but before I wrap up the dialogue and the discussions, uh, is there any last thoughts you'd like to share with uh, us today? I know that uh, it's early, probably still early in the morning uh, in both your regions. Uh, it's going to the afternoon uh, here in Fiji at about to about four o'clock. But uh, uh, if you have any last uh, nuggets of wisdom you'd like to share with us, maybe I'll give you a minute each or so, and then I'll wrap up our discussion for today. Uh, Miss Titi, first uh, to you, please. Yeah, uh, I thank uh, International IDEA for providing this forum. I learned a lot from the questions and also from Mr. Louis. Uh, me and Mr. Louis have a long cooperation and also I learned a lot also from him. Uh, and for the future, I would like to uh, still uh, communicate and having a, a cooperation with all CSOs from Fiji. Uh, please don't mind, uh, uh, don't feel hesitate to contact me. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, very happy to share my knowledge and experience. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Louis. Yes, I would like to thank uh, International IDEA, uh, Adi, Lina, um, Rajan, and everyone there. Of course, uh, Romolo for that excellent uh, part, uh, facilitation. And uh, um, it, it's really, you know, being patient. I think uh, Titi emphasized that. Uh, it's not going to, Things are not going to happen overnight. The challenges are enormous. I saw a comment by uh, my friend uh, Pakhadar uh, Gumay when he said, you know, we can advance democracy, but there will always be those who will pull it back. So it is a constant uh, fight. It's a constant struggle, but uh, um, CSOs have to be there. They have to just be patient. They have to, uh, they have to continue the conversation. And, and yes, we will make ourselves available. Uh, it's I think I don't think it's going to be an issue uh, with me and uh, uh, Titi. And I speak uh, from experience because just like uh, what Titi said, I've learned a lot from my uh, occasional conversations with her. In fact, uh, the last time was when we he was she was invited to talk about the local elections in uh, Indonesia. Uh, under COVID uh, situation, and that somehow informed civil society uh, perspective in how we can conduct conduct our own elections uh, next year under COVID. So you see, when we talk and when we converse and we, we continue to keep the line open, we can actually benefit from uh, shared uh, knowledge and experiences. So let's do that. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Louis, Ms. Uh, Titi. Uh, we congratulate you both for not only the extensive uh, experience you bring to this uh, conversation today, but the work that you continue to do uh, for the democratic and electoral processes of your respective countries. So uh, thank you for sh being gracious with your time and your expertise to share that with us. Uh, what I've learned in summary from today's conversation is that, you know, not only has it been an informative dialogue, but it has also provided uh, provoking insights uh, on how you have worked with your challenges, with your resources, uh, with your networks and uh, to create the opportunities that is needed to bring about uh, the electoral changes uh, in both Indonesia and the Philippines. Uh, both of you obviously uh, are giants in your own uh, right, uh, providing extensive experiences uh, to the CSOs as well as within the government sector and uh, through the elect um, legislative process to bring about the legislative changes that is needed to continue to strengthen uh, the electoral um, uh, frameworks in Indonesia and uh, Philippines respectively. And of course, you've also highlighted that despite the significant contextual differences, uh, that the universal principles of democratic elections and the values that are associated with uh, democratic uh, elections are somewhat common across the democratic divide and across our different societies. Uh, so, you know, in summary, of course, there is no perfect uh, system. Uh, there's no perfect electoral system. Uh, there are many challenges that uh, CSOs will face, but learning from each other, uh, as well as talking to each other and building collisions is an important way forward uh, to ensure that CSOs remain engaged and active in this space. Uh, the, of course, the ongoing discussions and dialogue from strengthening to on strengthening the electoral systems and people is important and particularly in order to realize this fundamental human right, the right of people uh, to choose their government uh, needs to constantly be safeguarded, uh, not only by the legal frameworks that are in place, but also especially by CSOs and the, the, the community of voices uh, that needs to continue to speak uh, to uh, strengthen our electoral system. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, I know uh, um, it is only left uh, from uh, me, from my end as the moderator to thank you. Uh, Salamat uh, to you, uh, Mr. Louis. Uh, terima kasih to you, Ms. Titi. Uh, thank you again uh, to each and every participant uh, logging in from Fiji, from the Pacific and right across uh, the world in particular to our friends from Indonesia and uh, other Asian countries that are also logging in. And for those that will be following this post dialogue, thank you for being part of this very important conversation on democratic development in Melanesian uh, 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 states, but the, and in this context for Fiji. So uh, to the fantastic team in, uh, at International IDEA, uh, both uh, your officers in Europe and in Australia, thank you for creating this platform. It's an important platform and it needs to be an ongoing one as we continue to build knowledge, share experience and uh, work with each other in strengthening our electoral spaces. So from me to you all, thank you, salamat, and terima kasih. Terima kasih. Thank you, everyone.